that off because it's going to drive her nuts between what I'm saying and when it comes through the headset for her. Sure. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're going live now. And, uh, um, you know, we'll let people get, get on here. Hello everybody, Scott Roberts here from Explore Scientific and this is Explore Now and I have with me uh, Claude and Teresa, Claude Plymate and Teresa Bippert Plymate. I was, I was correct on how to pronounce her name uh, and I'm glad, <laughs> since we're friends, we're old friends, <laughs> I should actually know how to spell, pronounce her name. I do know how to spell it. Anyhow, um, uh, I'm really excited to bring uh, us into the Big Bear Solar Observatory. They're actually in the dome right now, um, and uh, uh, it's great, great to have you guys with us. Um, uh, how, how is, how's the weather up there today? Um, actually, we've had some high clouds most of the day. I have not been able to get any science data today due to that, but uh, that allowed me to close the mirror cover and be a little more comfortable coming up here because uh, this is a telescope we don't leave to its own devices. It needs continual adult supervision. Yes, right. And so um, let's let's talk about Big Bear Solar Observatory just a little bit. Um, uh, when does the observatory actually get built up there? When, when, because you, this is now the what the second actually, telescope installation. Actually, uh, that's the first part of my talk, so we can put that off okay. until <laughs> we will talk I about get into it. the slides itself. <laughs> we will talk about it right now. Well, let's just jump right into uh, my guests here. So, uh, and we'll start with your wife, uh, Teresa. Uh, has uh, she's been an astronomy lover for many many years, right? Uh, uh, it says uh, that uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She graduated Go ahead. from from the University of Sonoma Sonoma State, uh, University of Arizona, right? And uh, she went to James Cook uh, University in Australia. She did some graduate work there, but unfortunately the department kind of fell apart and uh, she was unable to finish up the master's there. I was starting to work on a doctorate there, but uh, both of those kind of uh, disintegrated. I see, I see. Well, uh, the thing that uh, I'm, I'm really amazed at is the uh, uh, various roles that she's taken on in professional astronomy uh, you know, she was on with the University of Arizona's Stewart Observatory, uh, part of the multi-band imaging photometer uh, team for the Spitzer Space Telescope, and uh, spent seven years at Kitt Peak at the, as a technical specialist for McMath Pierce Solar Telescope, where also you were uh, working, is that right? Uh, yeah, at the time I spent 20, I didn't move around nearly as much as Teresa did. She spent a career bouncing around. She came to the McMath uh, as the technical specialist. Uh, I, at the time, became the uh, site manager 
it was kind of awkward because, of course, she, due to nepotism laws, couldn't report directly to me, so we both reported to our supervisor. Mm -hmm. But after seven years, Teresa suddenly came to me and said, you know, it's probably a really bad idea that we're both tied to the same budget. So she decided to move <laughs> off, and that's when she went to work. Um, I think at that point she went down and became the tech writer for the Solus telescope, another NSO telescope. I see. It's yeah, been and, a couple and, of years there. One of the things I've noticed about all professional astronomers, professional researchers, is that um, uh, you know you're constantly uh, at the whim of funding, uh, you know uh, whether it's from the National Science Foundation or other organizations, universities or whatever, um, and uh, so there's always kind of a there's a competitiveness to stay in the game, so to speak. Um, but you've been in the game for a long time, is that right? I've been very fortunate. Most of my career, I was not on what's called soft money. I've been actual staff. So I was not, for most of my career, I was not on that one or three year proposal cycle. Uh, Teresa was not always as fortunate. And uh, she was working for the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer in 2010 when uh, the economy took that huge dive last time. NASA took a huge hit and suddenly overnight just had to cancel all their contracts. So very unexpectedly, she was out of, uh, out of a job. And unfortunately, while everybody found out that she was available, wanted her, nobody had any funding because all the grants were cut. Ah, yeah, that's very tough. That's very tough. Well, she hasn't stopped doing astronomy. Uh, you know, I know that she uh, really dived into the amateur astronomy scene, uh, uh, has done a ton of outreach, both of you have, you know, so, um, and I feel very fortunate to know both of you. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been great, and uh, you two are astronomers, you know, in the best tradition. Um, and uh, I think have inspired a lot of amateur astronomers and just inspired people in general. So uh, why don't we get started with your presentation and, um, and we'll okay. get rolling here. Uh, before we start on that, there were a couple of things I wanted to say very quickly. Uh, first of all, of course, go SpaceX. I think today we all witnessed another giant leap for mankind. Today, today Mars somehow seems just a little bit closer than it did yesterday. So That's right. Phenomenal. On the other side, I want to acknowledge what a remarkably difficult time this is for every person around the globe. There's, I've noticed a lot of people, you included, that are trying to produce content putting that out to the net for us all, trying to produce something positive to bring us together in a time that we can't be together. So I'd first like to start off by commending you for all the effort you've been putting into this. And uh, I hope that uh, maybe this talk in some small way will add to that positivity. So. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, um, it's been my pleasure. And um, so, and I want to thank, I want to thank you and Teresa for doing this on such short notice, really. And, um, uh, you know, I know that, uh, I know you enjoy doing educational outreach, but uh, uh, it still takes time away from something else you might be able to do. So thank you very much for taking your time for everyone. And uh, let me say, Teresa will be behind the, the uh, camera most of the time, but I'm hoping that uh, there will be at least some time at the end for her to take the headset and say a few words. And uh, Teresa, do, do feel uh, free to kibitz and uh, jump in at any moment also. Sure. Yeah, let me, uh, let me take a little Dick bit there. of a moment here before you get started. 
I just want to recognize some of the people that have joined us. Uh, we have Daniel Mouncey, uh, Dr. D from, uh, from uh, Woodland Hills uh, Cameron Telescope. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. D gives all kinds of great reviews. We've got Bergman Scooter here. Uh, he's joined us on many of these programs. Uh, Mbante, Mbante is from Cameroon, uh, joining us from all the way over there, which is really cool. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matt uh, Ota, and uh, he is uh, hugely into outreach, and so that's great. We have Gary Palmer from the UK uh, joining us. Gary's uh, way into solar astronomy as well. He's best known for his solar images. Dan Janicek uh, is with us as well. So, um, and I'll, I'll let you get started with any, without any interruption here. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, Big Bear uh, has been around for quite a while. We've, uh, this telescope, the Goody Solar Telescope, has been online now for over a decade. And uh, up until very recently, we had the distinction of being able to call ourselves the highest resolution solar telescope in history. However, in just the past few months, that has has uh, changed. The National Solar Observatory, my previous employer, has uh, shown their first light image from the four meter, far larger telescope they've developed out in Hawaii, the Daniel K. Inouye Telescope, which now puts us down to the second highest resolving power solar telescope in existence. <laughs> so we'll have to reconcile ourselves to dealing with that. Now, first of all, where is Big Bear Lake? Uh, you just pointed out there's people coming in from all over. Here's a map of Southern California, an image. Here's the uh, Los Angeles Basin. Up somewhere around here is uh, Mount Wilson, Palomar is somewhere down here. And out here is the San Bernardino Mountains. Zoom in, here's the San Bernardino Mountains. Right in the middle is Big Bear Lake. Zooming in a bit more, Here's the lake, some ski resorts to off the south shore. And off the north shore, there is a, you just see that small thousand foot causeway extending out oh, yeah. into the lake. That is Big Bear Solar Observatory. And here is a picture that shows us, literally when the lake was quite low, out in the lake. So why Big Bear Lake? This observatory was first conceived of back in the 1960s by as a Caltech observatory along with Mount Wilson, um, Palomar, that sort of thing. And uh, they wanted to have a world-class solar observatory within driving distance of their campus. Uh, of course, Southern California is known for having good astronomical scene. Again, Mount Wilson, Palomar are good examples of that. But they're and we have good weather statistics here in Southern California. But one issue solar telescopes have to contend with that uh, solar telescopes don't is that ground heating. We're necessarily observing during the day, the sun is out, the ground is getting warm, thermals are rising up around the telescope, destroying that natural good steam. Well, astronomer Bob Layton at Caltech had the idea that one way to suppress that ground he layer heating is to have the telescope surrounded by water out in the lake. Oops, wrong way. So a site survey was conducted of numerous sites around the southwest, and uh, Big Bear was determined to be a near ideal site for a solar observatory. Uh, Professor Hal Zurn, who is well known in the solar community, particularly for the uh, textbook he wrote on solar astrophysics, uh, led the development and became director of the observatory. The first generation telescopes, answering your earlier question, Scott, were actually a pair of 10-inch refractors that went ah. online in 1969. Uh, that's, of course, long before my time. I don't know a lot about them, but I have found a couple these couple pictures of the first generation telescopes. They were 
embedded in a single spar, obviously, with the two focal planes coming out the back of that spar. I recognize these two uh, Halle Leo filters. We still have those, actually, downstairs here. I should have brought one up. Too bad. And then the detectors of choice at the time were 16 millimeter film cameras. There was also another large refractor sitting on top, and that's about all I know of that generation. Then in 1972 came the second generation telescope. There was a 26 inch space telescope designed to go on Skylab 2. Now you've never heard of Skylab 2 and there's a good reason for that. It did not get funded, it never flew, which left that uh, telescope orphaned. So somehow Hal Zurn got uh, hold of that telescope and convinced NASA that Big Bear would be a good place to test it, and it became the, uh, the workhorse telescope here at the observatory uh, up until the uh, it was replaced by the current generation 1.6. And you can see here that uh, original mount with that big telescope inside a vacuum chamber to suppress the more thermals inside the telescope itself sitting on the same original mount. That poor mount must have really been overloaded. Um, I had the opportunity to actually see the original telescope at its current location. It uh, was, once it was decommissioned here, it was donated to the Los Angeles Astronomical Society and uh, is or was at least housed down at uh, Griffith Observatory where they have been in pulling it out for public outreach. And there's a picture of me with the original telescope, naked outside of its vacuum chamber. <laughs> so, uh, Hal Zurn eventually retired in 1997. And uh, think about that era. Caltech was heavily investing in stellar astronomy at the time, developing the, Quing, the twin Keck 10 meter telescopes out in Hawaii. So, uh, they took that opportunity and made the decision to divest of all their solar assets, which includes Big, or included Big Bear Solar Observatory here and the Owens Valley Radio Solar Array in Eastern California. Caltech put out a request for proposal for operation of Big Bear, and of all places, New Jersey Institute of Technology put in the winning proposal. Now, NJIT, New Jersey, may seem like an odd fit to the Big Bear Solar Observatory, but it turned out several of the faculty members from the NJIT Center for Solar Terrestrial Research uh, did their PhD research at Caltech, and so were well familiar with Big Bear and uh, understood its potential. So the one who really pushed that through and uh, was the spearhead behind it was uh, Dr. Phil Goody, pictured here. Uh, here is our alphabet soup now. We are, of course, Big Bear Solar Observatory under the Center for Solar Terrestrial Research of New Jersey Institute of Technology. <laughs> so when Phil took over in 97, um, there were big plans in solar astronomy. First of all, the Japanese were planning to launch a half meter, a 20 inch solar telescope called Hinode into space. And my, where I was working at the time, the National Solar Observatory, was laying the groundwork for their four meter, what has now gone online and has been dedicated as the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. So in that environment, how could BBSO continue to be relevant? Well, Phil knew that he had to think big. The question was really how big? In telescopes, size always matters. Let's face it, bigger is always better. Um, Larger telescopes, of course, collect up more uh, photons, allow us to see fainter objects. That's not the primary concern in solar astronomy, but larger aperture also means resolution. 
And most of you are likely familiar with this uh, simple equation that says the minimum resolving angle in radians, the smallest angle you can resolve, is equal to 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the aperture of the telescope. So if we uh, assume we're going to stay in the visible, middle of the visible, about 500 nanometers, uh, we can plot out what the, res the theoretic resolving power of a telescope is versus its aperture, and that's what we have here. Uh, and I put this in arc seconds. So, of course, not surprisingly, as you get larger telescopes, your resolving power goes, gets small, finer and finer. Already at an eighth of, an arc, eighth of a meter, about five inch telescope, you're down at an arc second. So that's why refractors actually do quite nicely on planets, that sort of thing. You go up to uh, a 10 inch telescope, quarter of an arc, a uh, quarter of a meter, you're already down to half an arc second resolution. In Ode, that half meter telescope, 20 inch telescope, is down at a quarter arc second resolution. Unfortunately, we live, or maybe fortunately, I like to breathe, um, we live under this sea of atmosphere that's constantly in motion, constantly uh, boiling, causing turbulence in our image quality. And even at the best sites available on Earth, the atmosphere limits our resolving power to something like half an arc second resolution. So, of course, at some point, your aperture will be able to resolve more than the atmosphere actually allows. And that's around, actually, a 10-inch telescope. So not coincidentally, the first telescopes here at Big Bear were those 10-inch telescopes. But uh, that doesn't cut it in an era when you're starting to get half-meter telescopes in space, that sort of thing. And uh, yes, occasionally, maybe you can beat this limit with lucky imaging or uh, speckle interferometry or something like that. But as a rule of thumb, it basically holds. So, uh, yes, space has perfect seam, but is exceedingly expensive. Here's a cartoon showing that uh, we have an astronomical object. I guess it doesn't work for me to point my finger at it. At some distance, it could be, in our case, 93 million miles away, or it could be billions of light years, depending on what it was, with giving essentially perfect wave flat wave fronts to uh, our space telescopes, including Hinode, Hubble, that sort of thing. But in the last 100 kilometers, which is only a th about a third of a millisecond, it passes through the atmosphere and gets distorted and blurred in some random way. So what to do? Well, the answer came in the form of adaptive optics. Uh, first conceived of in the in the 1950s by uh, Babcock, I think it was out at uh, Mount Wilson, but really was not practical to try to, to develop until the advent of high-speed digital computers. Unbeknownst to the rest of us, the idea didn't completely go away. In secret, the DOD started to develop adaptive optics in the late 70s and 80s and was uh, at least partially declassified in the late 80s. Since then, adaptive optics have become a mainstay of just about all large telescopes worldwide. What is adaptive optics? Well, here's a cartoon showing a uh, nice flat wavefront, undisturbed wavefront, that in that last 100 kilometers, third of a millisecond, passes through the atmosphere and becomes distorted assume in here we're ignoring the fact somewhere in this uh, optical train is a telescope, that distorted wavefront is reflected off of a deformable mirror that is deformed in just the right shape to cancel out that wavefront distortion and uh, restoring the image quality of the telescope, which then can be passed through some re-imaging optics down to the science camera. Meanwhile, Part of that wavefront is picked off from a beam splitter or dichroic filter or something like that, sent off to, and I, I, I can't do justice to this in the, in the three minutes I have to talk about adaptive optics, that's a talk in its own right, but it goes to some optics that uh, sense the residual wavefront error 
in that uh, wavefront. The computer then analyzes that and determines what corrections need to be done to the mirror, sends voltages to the drivers, and then uh, sends the correct voltages to the piezoelectrics on the deformable mirror to make that shift to cancel out that residual error. And this servo cycle goes on at nauseum and must be done fast enough such that the sky does not have a chance to change before it makes the next correction. How fast is that? Well, it depends on your site, the wind, your aperture, your natural scene, etc. But rule of thumb, something in the thousands of corrections per second. And if it's designed correctly, it can produce diffraction limited images, which are as good as if your telescope were in space. But the dirty secret about adaptive optics is that only works over a very narrow field. The reason for that is think about the fact that we are correcting this wavefront, analyzing this wavefront to correct. But what about the edge of your field over here? It's passing through a different part of the atmosphere, getting a different distortion as it passes through the atmosphere. And so that correction does applies less and less as you move off of the point that you are correcting for. Here is the actual deformable mirror we use here, and you'll often hear the term just DM, and I might even slip and just call it a DM, but that means deformable mirror. Our deformable mirror is a 100 millimeter, very thin mirror. It's a commercial product from Zenetics, about a millimeter thick, with 357 actuators on the back. And you can see that bundle of wires hanging out the back. That is what controls the piezo controllers off the back of the telescope, off the back of the uh, deformable mirror down in our Coudet lab. Now, what can adaptive optics do? Well, here's an example. Hopefully, you're seeing my movie. This is uh, granulation on the solar surface. And an example of fairly poor scene here at Big Bear. Turn the adaptive optics on and you get a dramatic improvement. You can see features down wow. far sub arc second there. But we're not done yet. Each frame that we collect is actually a data cube of 100 frames deep. Uh, we have a very high-speed CCD. We can take 100 frames in a few seconds, download them to disk, and then repeat the process. Then in post-processing, we can use something called speckle reconstruction that goes through that data cube and is able to extract the highest Holy resolution Look at that. Uh, Look at that. That's image beautiful. elements in there. So. Yeah, hey, this um, is a phenomenal movie. You can see a lot going on. Sure, sure. Uh, you're uh, seeing I just quite, wanted to uh, take a, a moment here to, uh, to uh, recognize some other people who have joined us here uh, tonight, Claude. Uh, we've got, sure. uh, I, I mentioned Dan Janicek. Uh, Angel Puri has joined us. Uh, David Levy's on with us right now from uh, uh, Vail, Arizona. Uh, and Paul Cotton from uh, Cornwall uh, in the U.K., so uh, uh, Jim Baker's with us on as well. So it's, it's nice to have a nice group of people here. They're saying, uh, they're all saying this is a very informative uh, lecture. So I'll let you, uh, hopefully I haven't interrupted your, <laughs> your rhythm here, Claude. <laughs> so, but go ahead. I have no rhythm. I you have no <laughs> But okay. look at that so, amazing detail. That's just, that's mind-blowing. It is. Okay. Well, we'll get back to that. I have some examples at the end of the talk. Okay. Um, so, again, back to how big was big enough? Well, first of all, any new telescope had to be able to fit within the confines of the existing building, both spatial and weight-wise. It had, uh, building a new structure would be financially impractical, and this is California, just getting the permits would probably be impractical. Also, keep in mind that the sun is not a solid object, it's gaseous. So, the 
outer atmosphere will be somewhat diffuse in its appearance. It's not going to have sharp features. There is a lower limit to how fine of a structure the solar atmosphere can produce. Now, we don't know, I've heard different estimates of what that is, but uh, its uh, theory would predict it's somewhere in the ballpark of around 50 kilometers. So from Earth, that's, uh, that's zero, assuming again, we're still talking about the middle of the visible, 0 0.07 arc seconds. Mm -hmm. To achieve that, that requires at least a 1.5 meter aperture. Also, the telescope here was designed and justified and partially funded as a pathfinder slash technology demonstrator for that National Solar Observatory 4 meter, Daniel K. Inouye, or as we all call it, just DKIST, which I keep talking about, which uh, DKIST now has achieved first light in the 12th December 2019 just in time for the pandemic to hit, so I suspect that uh, their progress is being a little bit delayed, but uh, we'll talk more about DKIST in a little bit. So first, let's, let's now just go on a little virtual tour. Let's assume you pulled up to Big Bear Solar Observatory. What would you see? Well, as you come up the road, to the north side of the, uh, the road is our, what we call, onshore, our, uh, our main campus facilities there. It's very small. We have a very small staff here, uh, which we necessarily have to wear all several hats. So uh, here, I'll, I'll put on my, uh, my observer hat <laughs> for this part. Um, Onshore, we have uh, several facilities. We have a mach small machine shop, administrative office. Uh, the right side of this building is our, res our director's residence, although he hasn't been able to get out here for quite a while, certainly since the pandemic. Behind this building is a second building that houses, uh, I th think, about 10 offices. 10 offices, I think, okay. uh, and we have a garage. In the center, we have a meeting hall where uh, we also have some dorm rooms and a kitchen. Now, if you, that's facing north, if you turn around the other direction, then you are facing out the causeway to the dome here. The first thing you pass as you're walking out is, is another National Solar Observatory structure uh, known as the Global Oscillation Network Group. It's one of six sites around the world, six stations around the world, that have a small uh, turret for observing the sun. And these six sites all are measuring Doppler grams uh, constantly on the solar surface. They use that to uh, determine the standing waves inside the, uh, the solar surface, inside the sun to tease out the st internal structure of the sun, the temperature gradient, pressure gradient, flow velocities, even the magnetic field. It's a technique known as helioseismology and is quite analogous to what seismologists here on Earth do for internal structure of the Earth. Further down the causeway as we approach the dome, you'll come to the small dome, which uh, inside we have a, uh, a high-end amateur grade mount. It's a astrophysics El Capitan mount, very nice mount, nice. on which we have a, uh, a just simply a four inch refractor lens from Edmund Scientific Catalog with a nothing but a simple CCD, high-speed CCD is a detector on the back. But what makes it special is in between we have a phenomenal H-alpha uh, Leo filter. It's a Zeiss filter built back in the 60s and uh, allows us to get very nice quarter from images, full disk images of the sun. 
Uh, we use that as a context imager, so we pipe that full disk image into the telescope dome, into the observing room, and we can use that to monitor if there is any eruptive phenomena, uh, targets of opportunity on the sun. Then we approach the dome itself. There is only a single door in and out. Um, here's the first floor above these the observing room, third floor above that, and then the dome floor at the very top. I'll also draw your attention to this air handling system. We constantly pull air. Teresa, can you show the, uh, the vents on the side of the dome? We have vents. You can see these louvers open all the way around the telescope dome, which, uh, and then we have fans down below that pull air into the dome, vent it through the floor, and then on out the north side of the telescope. And of course, we are never looking out to the north. So let's go on inside. Here's the, we come in through this door here on the left. Here is the first floor. There's not a lot to see on the first floor. There is a bathroom down down there, important. Hmm. Far side there, we have a an office that is uh, a guest astronomer office, so astro visiting astronomers can stay in there. In the center, we have an electronics lab, which is really a terrible mess at the moment. And then on the right side here is my office over here, and last door is a janitor's closet. So turning around and just heading through this other door on the left, we come to the stairwell, come to the top of that stairwell, through the door to the right, we enter into our observing room. Now here's a picture from uh, Thursday after, uh, Scott, you asked me to give this talk. I tried to, I had to mm -hmm. call Nicholas due to the pandemic. We oh, are yeah. normally only only allowing a single individual into the dome at the time, at the time, but I talked to Nicholas in a panic that I need to get some pictures for a virtual tour through the dome. So uh, mm -hmm. we donned our, our masks and uh, he allowed me to take some pictures here. So, uh, so I should change to my, uh, ah, yeah, I'll change to, an obs to my observer hat. Okay, here's my observer hat now. <laughs> um, so How many hats do you have? Nicholas also wears, Nicholas also wears several hats. Um, I am the only one on staff that is actually um, primarily dedicated to operating the telescope. Nicholas's primary job is he is our optical engineer, a world-class optical engineer. He's from France. And uh, I don't tend to use his last name because I'm embarrassed at how badly I obliterate the pronunciation. So I hope he's not listening today. Um, the observing room, we somewhat split into sort of three stations. Over at the far side there, our monitors we use primarily for our science cameras. Since it's a solar beam, we can split into several channels simultaneously. Where Nicholas is here is uh, our telescope operations station, two monitors for controlling the main telescope, and a third monitor for a couple of miscellaneous things, and the GUI for the small dome outside. Then off to the left over here, there's a couple of monitors you can't see that are general purpose and up on the wall. But uh, here, closest to us in the picture is for adaptive optics control. Now, if I simply turn around behind me, um, is quite a mess. This is our electronics computer room. And uh, anybody that's that uh, dealt a lot with uh, servers, that sort of thing, probably recognize the rat's nest of uh, Ethernet, Cat5, and, and now becoming Cat6 cables over here. On the right is a picture showing our telescope control electronics. The right panel, the right uh, rack is mostly uh, all adaptive optics and uh, several terminals. We also have several archive servers in this room as well as camera control electronics. 
Hmm. Then, if we back, I'll go back from, whoops. So I go back, turn around, go back in through the observing, observing room, turn right, and there is one more door on the right that I can go through, which takes us into our CUDE lab. Um, perhaps some of your listeners here are not familiar with the term CUDE lab. Um, just about all large telescopes have a, uh, an instrument lab that is optically well separated from the physical telescope through a convoluted optical path. And that's called the CUDE lab. Uh, I spent most of my career thinking that that was probably named after some famous French optician yeah. or something or optical design engineer. I finally discovered just a few years ago it simply means elbow as in to bend and that <laughs> describes the convoluted <laughs> optical path to get the light down there. But it sounds so, so much better in French. It, it definitely does. loses. It certainly does. It certainly loses something in translation. Anyway, um, it's hard to get a good picture of our Coudet lab. It's very crowded in there. Keep in yeah. mind that uh, this facility was originally designed around a pair of 10-inch telescopes, and now we have uh, shoehorned a 1.6-meter, 63-inch telescope into that same facility. So. It is, space is a major premium here, so sometimes it's difficult to get a good, uh-oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, a good picture of uh, some of these, or some of the optical bands you have in the CUDE lab. To the right is um, a high-speed CCD that uh, we use, this is what we take uh, those photospheric movies with, like uh, the one you saw earlier, and you'll see more in the coming up. To the right here, this optical tower is the wavefront sensor for our adaptive optics. Um, over here, on the lower left, if you can see my cursor, is our near-infrared array detector. It has a Stirling engine for closed cycle cooling on the back of it uh, to keep it down at, uh, we serve with that at 90 Kelvin. Up on our optics bench, these uh, small black cans are Fabry Perot interferometers. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, they're similar to like uh, the day star etalons that uh, are produced. Basically, uh, there are two reflective plates that allow light to reflect back and forth inside of, and depending on the spacing, only certain wavelengths will constructively interfere and pass on out. It allows for very narrow band imaging in two dimensions. Um, so unlike a day star filter, the Fabry Pro, we can uh, control those plates very accurately and very quickly with piezoelectronics to move them back and forth, allowing us to actually scan through a spectral line very quickly. The one in the foreground we use for mostly for H alpha imaging, and in the background is for our near infrared array. Excellent. Now, if we move on up the uh, another flight of stairs to level three, uh, just below us here, this was the original observing floor for the original Big Bear Solar Observer uh, Observatory. However, when the new telescope was put in, they had to raise the telescope higher to get it into the widest section of the, well, the 5 8 sphere dome that we have now to shoehorn this thing into the dome. So the observing floor, another fault floor was added, uh, leaving this floor available. And was we've uh, re-dedicated the floor to infrared instrumentation. And I tend to, I try to refer to it as our IR CUDE lab. And uh, this big instrument here is our all cryogenic 
infrared spectral polarimeter known as CIRA. It's a huge instrument. Um, it's closed cycle helium cooled. If you walk around the far side of that, you can look in the other side, and that's what the image in the lower right is. Um, all the four optics, the transfer optics from the telescope into it, we are enclosed in kind of a terrarium kind of arrangement. At least I call it the terrarium. Um, and you can see part of it here in the lower right. We do not have adaptive optics for the IR. That we only have adaptive optics down in our main CUDE lab. But we do have an image stabilizer known as a correlation tracker up on this little optics bench here. The input window, if you can see my cursor, is right there into the, into the cryostat. And in front of the input window, we have polarization optics. And in the foreground, you can see my toy dinosaurs. It looked a little sterile in the, in the uh, terrarium <laughs> without them. Then if you go off to the side, up one more flight of stairs, you come to the dome where we are now with the telescope floor itself. Now let's talk a bit about the telescope. The primary mirror itself, um, should we? Can we Oh, maybe I can move over here just a little bit. The primary mirror is a 1.6 meter, highly off-axis parabola, f2.4. Now, you can see in this uh, illustration below that uh, here's an illustration of the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is being developed by the University of Arizona, Teresa, where Teresa used to work. Um, Back when they were first starting to propose to build this giant Magellan telescope, they needed to demonstrate that they could produce such off-axis parabola mirrors. Now, in this illustration of the GMT, notice there are seven 8.4 meter mirrors in a flower petal ring. The one in the center is, of course, a symmetric parabola. But those mirrors off to the side have to continue that same parabolic shape as they go off to the side. So you can't just take a parabolic mirror and tip it off to the side. You have to actually polish that shape into it as if it were part of a single large mirror. Nobody had ever developed the techniques for polishing such off-axis parabolic mirrors before nor how testing them. So University of Arizona, before they tackled those 8.4 meter mirrors, decided they should build a demonstrator model. Uh, Phil Goody got, somehow found out about that and cut a deal with the University of Arizona Mirror Lab where they would split costs. Big Bear and the University of Arizona would um, pay half each U of A would get to the mirror lab, would get to develop the techniques for polishing off axis mirrors and testing them. And Big Bear got the mirror. So often when we're asked, for example, uh, recently the university, NJIT, sent their uh, insurance agent out here to come through our facility and make recommendations and asked, so what is this mirror worth? Well, they didn't like the answer that we could, the only answer we could give is it's invaluable, it's irreplaceable. He said, no, no, just how much is it worth? It's like, well, it doesn't matter. There's only one place in the world that could produce this mirror. It's a one-off, and uh, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. This is an irreplaceable mirror. Yes, the university could, in in principle, make another one, but they're kind of busy making giant 8.4 meter mirrors for uh, GMT, and I'll bet there's a queue of others wanting big mirrors. So no matter how much money we threw at it, I don't think we could replace this mirror. So um, we don't want to break it. Um, so in short, 
this mirror we have, this 1.6 meter mirror, is a one-fifth scale model of a giant Magellan telescope mirror. Okay, so the primary itself is a daughter segment of a imaginary 5.3 meter uh, parent parabola, cookie cuttered out from the side, not literally, but figuratively. And it's uh, made of ultra low expansion zurder, which is a shot material. It's a thin mirror, only 100 millimeters thick, and uh, which allows us to have an all reflected, unobstructed optical system. Now, why do we want unobstructed? Well, in a typical reflector, of course, the secondary is symmetrically in front of your primary mirror and is held in place by some kind of spider structure to hold it there. That will create diffraction. In stellar astronomy, that's not a big issue. Stars, well, stars are point sources. Who cares if they have little diffraction spikes? Besides, they're kind of pretty. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at an extended object like the sun, every resolution element across your image will have diffraction spikes. That will add together as kind of a diffuse halo and um, will degrade our resolution and even worse, will degrade our contrast. While the sun is very bright, it is really a fairly low contrast object. Uh, finally, being an all reflective surface, that allows us to observe both the visible and the infrared. Teresa's having to hand held the camera, so I'll come back here so she can put it back on the tripod. She was. Now, what we have is actually off-axis Gregorian telescope. That may be uh, a bit of a surprise to several of the astronomers in the listing right now because most people consider the Gregorian an inferior optical design to uh, say a Cassegrain or, or a uh, Ritchie Critian, something like that. But there is a good reason for going with Gregorian. Now, Here's an, a, a diagram showing a Cassegrain, where you have a typical para, parabolic mirror at the back, which forms a focus forward of that mirror at some point, converges to a focus. But ahead of that uh, focal plane, a convex secondary mirror intercepts that beam and sends the focal plane back in a, in a uh, long, slow cone of light back to an image plane typically behind the mirror. In a Gregorian, that uh, mirror, instead of having a convex mirror ahead of the primary image, we use a concave elliptical mirror, which is behind the, the primary image, giving us access to the primary image. That is important because well, this is a 1.6 meter mirror. A 1.6 oh, wow. meter surface area of slightly over two square meters. Now, the sun is constantly beating down on the Earth with the Earth's surface somewhere something like a, a kilowatt per square meter of power. We are collecting up the two kilowatts of power and concentrating that down to a primary image only 36 millimeters across. That is enough heat power, heat energy to melt. Now, the way we handle, deal with it is um, at that primary focus up at, the, up at the top of the tower. Teresa, can you actually, can I open the mirror cover for just a moment? Stand by one moment, see if I can, if the clouds will allow me to open the mirror cover momentarily.
Now, the direction that we're looking right now, are we looking at the mirror itself? You're looking up at the number two mirror tower, and okay. you should see a very bright spot. That is the primary yes. image plane for the telescope. Down, which in, the, is, down again, in the lower the part image. of the image, right? Correct? Okay, I don't see what uh, Teresa is pointing at, but uh, I assume that's in your image plane there. Yes. Let me close the mirror cover. Well, since I'm not, uh, so I don't have to concentrate too much on the telescope. And what you see is our number two mirror tower at the top of the telescope. Okay. So that uh, primary, primary image plane is in front of our concave number two mirror. Now you can see in the image I have here, what we have is a highly reflective aluminum surface, which you were just looking at, polished flat and hollowed out behind with a constant water glycol mixture circulating through it to keep it from melting down. That is what we put the, uh, the image on. But in the center of that, uh, of that what we call heat stop is a three arc minute aperture. Hmm. So most of the heat energy, most of the light that strikes that primary image is reflected away. This image I have in the, uh, on the left of our of our uh, PowerPoint here is a, uh, a frame grab from a web camera I just have mounted on the side of the telescope that constantly monitors that image to make sure we know where the sun on our, uh, on our heat stop is at all times. Now, you can see that three arc minute hole in the middle of the uh, image there. So that is what we're looking through, is we are seeing that three, three arc minute field of view out of the entire solar image. Um, keep in mind, okay, first of all, a tenth of an arc sec, a tenth of a uh, solar image, well, that means we're passing about one hundredth the energy through to the, um, to the mirror behind it and our downstream optics. So instead of two, two kilowatts hitting our number two mirror and going on into the, into the Coudet lab, we're only passing about 20 watts of power. But keep in mind, over that three arc minute field, we still have all the brightness, all the resolution of the telescope. We're just limiting the field of view. And um, it is critical in this telescope that we keep track of that, uh, where we are pointing at all times. That's why I say that we never leave this telescope alone with the, uh, the mirror cover open, because if that beam were to get off of the heat stop, it would do damage. Notice just below the heat stop here, there's a shiny stainless steel plate. Around the periphery of that heat stop, we have uh, temperature sensors. And if they ever see any anomalous reading, they will open a solenoid at the down here. A spring will then pull this stainless steel plate into the beam to try to protect the telescope from the direct exposure. Now that happened once I, I, in the early development of this telescope, there were some confusion. Is that in the beam? Is that in the image, Teresa? Oh, okay. You can't see that. Okay, I think you'll see. Um, see. This was the... Oh my god. ...directly to <laughs> the beam. I'm told that that was about 30 seconds exposure of the beam. The mirror cover did not close properly and so that uh, this slid into place. It was right. exposed to the beam for about 30 seconds. And what you're seeing is, I keep saying a 36 millimeter image. This is a... Hey, Claude. Claude, we have lost uh, audio, it seems. Yeah.
Yeah, I think we're still... Let's see if we can get it back, folks. I still have video. Okay, do you have my okay, audio now? We got you back. Yeah, we got you back. Huh. Okay. Uh, I guess my USB connection failed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions here, Claude. We got we got some questions here. Um, sure. Gary Palmer. Uh, he says, Claude, with all this solar equipment, what solar phenomenon do you like looking at or working on most? And and John Varsic, who also also works with you. Uh, is mentioning that active regions are most exciting, but the quiet sun is also quite interesting. Now, that's something you and I talked about earlier. Um, what, what, what are your comments on all this? Well, of course, uh, active regions. As a telescope operator, I like working on active regions. Why? Because it's easy. We can point the telescope. We know where we're pointing. There's a sunspot. We can lock the adaptive optics. It's easy. Yeah. But intellectually, I actually find the quiet sun fascinating. And uh, I'll have to be careful what I'm saying if uh, John's online. Hi, John. Um, <laughs> John's here. <laughs> That's right. The, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dynamics going on in the quiet sun that... Uh, just I just don't think has gotten enough attention scientifically. And uh, maybe it would be best to wait until we get down to some of the photospheric images to talk about the convection coming up, how that's sweeping out magnetic fields, concentrating that in the inner granular regions, things like that. But there's a lot of dynamics that is going on that I don't think is well explained. And I think a lot of what... Um, there's a lot of science that I think just needs to be done. So I am fascinated by the quiet sun. And also I like anything that uh, isn't as well studied because it's easier to deal with. Right. Uh, more questions or should I move on? Yeah, go ahead and go on. That's great. Okay. Um, well, I already mentioned that um, the original classic hemispherical dome had to be replaced by, to uh, shoehorn this telescope into the existing facility. So the original hemispherical dome was replaced by a 5-8 sphere, pictured here, which um, is a modified, literally is a modified <coughs> radar dome means that it is fiberglass, it's uh, meant to be lightweight, um, and, but still rotates and has an aperture that follows the sun around to keep the, uh, as little energy inside the dome as possible. We don't want a lot of heating with the lake around us, keeping the ground thermals around. We don't want that, uh, that uh, heat to get into the dome itself and warm up in here and create thermals inside the dome. Now here is a um, engineering drawing showing a cutaway of the facility. The mount itself was designed and built by DFM Engineering in Longmont, Colorado. Mm -hmm. It is a modification of their standard 50-inch solar uh, telescope design. What are you handing this to me for? Oh. Oh, I thought you were planning to do something. Teresa handed me the camera for a moment. Okay. Um, this also shows the, coup, the two Coudet labs below us. Uh, okay. One floor below is that infrared Coudet lab. Two floors down is our main Coudet lab. Now, uh, maybe I should point out the way optically Maybe you could, right above our, above us is that number two mirror, that uh, daughter segment of a okay. off-axis elliptical mirror. That sends the light down to a third mirror right here that sends the beam, folds the beam, and sends that through the declination bearing right here off to a fourth mirror 
that then sends the beam down through our equatorial axis to the south end of the telescope. Since it's going through the polar axle of the telescope, that beam doesn't move. Of course, it does rotate, but it doesn't move. So all we have to do is take a couple of mirrors to then intercept that and send that beam straight down to our coup de labs down below. Mm -hmm. Now, that number two mirror above us does experience flexure. One downside of this off-axis telescope is that uh, we don't have as rigid of a structure as you would if you had a, a, a truss, a classic truss system telescope. We have this A-frame structure up to the top, and it does experience flexure through the day. Also, there is some thermal expansion of the telescope. Um, the way we deal with that is our number two mirror is mounted on a hexapod. A hexapod is uh, six struts that uh, push can change their length on the uh, on the platform that the number two mirror is mounted on, which gives us six degrees of rota of uh, freedom. We have rotation, tip, tilt, X, Y, and Z translation, such that uh, we can monitor any static aberrations that build up in the telescope through the day and cancel that out by moving that number two mirror around to recolumnate the telescope. Having a off-axis telescope is a little more complicated than a symmetric telescope because not only do we have to worry about collimation that it is in the beam, but there is also the relative rotation of the mirrors with respect to each other. So the way we handle that is, unfortunately, that's not, that is done manually. It's not done all automatically. We monitor using the adaptive optics any static aberrations that are building up in the telescope, and we can uh, then command the hexapod to move a little bit and try to tune that out. Again, it's done manually. Every hour or two, we have to touch that up. The three of us that operate the telescope, Nicholas I've already talked about, John Varsik, who's apparently on there. Hi, John. Let me know if I say anything wrong. And uh, <laughs> myself, we've gotten pretty good at recognizing what aberration, what we have to do to take out specific aberrations in the telescope. Okay. All right. Uh, Claude, we have a couple, of, we have a couple of comments. We have a couple of comments from our viewers here. Uh, Gary Palmer uh, is... Uh, Oh, well, first off, Mike Overacker is saying interesting info. Thank you. Uh, Gary Palmer says he's been working on magnesium images for the last year, and that is showing lots of different structures not seen in other wavelengths. Um, Anshul Puri uh, has a question. He's, he says, is there a certain time of day when you are able to see optimum results as well as minimum heat gain, or is it just immaterial? Also, is the telescope strictly for solar observations, or could it be used for deep space objects in the night sky if needed? Okay. Um, the question... Uh, what was Gary that? was talking about magnesium imaging. Yeah. Magnesium Im imaging. Yes. I don't know if that's something you do there. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we don't, but uh, different wavelengths like that will will image different atmospheres up in the chromosphere. We don't happen to use that, but each different wavelength measures a different atmospheric level. So, yeah, you do see different, um, different phenomena at different mm -hmm. wavelengths. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when I get to the, the data. What was the second question? Okay, we, uh, and Ansel Puri had a couple of questions. First off, he wanted to know, is there a certain time of day when you're able to see optimum results oh, that's as right. well as minimum heat gain? Oh, that's right. Okay, that's right. Um, this telescope, of course, um, most telescopes often are really good very early in the day before ground heating. We don't have that difficulty here because of the leg. Right. So late morning, midday, tends to be very good for us. However, uh, 
any time extreme when we start looking further over, looking through more of the atmosphere, we t our, atmos our scene tends to get worse the more atmosphere we're looking over. So this time of day, oh my goodness, I need to uh, stow the telescope here in a moment. Okay. This time of day are, would be typically starting to, to be poor. So um, lastly, can this telescope be used as a, a stellar telescope? This telescope is a purpose-built solar telescope. It is used strictly for solar. Now, yeah, one in, in principle, it could be used for other things. However, keep in mind the whole concept of the lake environment that suppresses that uh, daytime heating and keeps those thermals down because sure. the lake tends to be cooler than the ambient daytime temperature. The reverse happens at night. Here in the oh. mountains, our temperature, the atmosphere temperature plummets precipitously, meaning that the lake then is warmer, creating thermals. Uh, so huh. unfortunately, the very effect that makes us very good, this site out in the lake, very good for solar astronomy is actually rather poor for nighttime astronomy. Uh, that's, so that's no, a very we good concentrate point. specifically on solar. Mm -hmm. um, I need to hand the, uh, the okay. headset to Teresa for All just right. a moment. We'll talk, Maybe we'll she we'll can say a couple Teresa. words. And sure. I, need, I need to get the telescope over to stow position. Yeah. So I'll be no just problem. a moment. No problem. Folks, this is a real working observatory, and uh, there is kind of this window uh, where they were able to have the dome open uh, to create more light inside of there. But... Uh, uh, but I'm glad we get to speak with Teresa here. Teresa, you, um, uh, of course, you did a lot of work at uh, McMath, uh, uh, the McMath uh, telescope, which was uh, shut down just a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, just a few years ago. It was very sad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, but they have been able to, uh, they got funding from what I understand, to make it an outreach uh, uh, center, which has, I guess, maybe some mixed emotions. They could have, uh, with that kind of money, they could have uh, kept research going. But, um, you know, at, at the very, very least, they're able to do something with it, I suppose. Yeah, that uh, we were kind of shocked at the uh, amount that got thrown for uh, doing outreach, it could have possibly run the telescope for a decade. <laughs> oh well, but it's right. you know the different pots of money thing, and sure. And I wanted to say really quickly, please. Um, <laughs> I apologize for the pointing of the camera. I didn't realize I'm watching on the live feed with the sound turned off. And I thought I was going to use that for pointing, but the delay was too long. No, that's <laughs> so fine. So I was guessing where I was pointing that camera. Yeah. So next time I'm going to have to uh, figure out a way to see where I'm actually pointing when I'm pointing it. <laughs> you know, it's it's actually amazing we can do this stuff at all. I mean, you guys are, you know, I'm in Arkansas. You're in California. We're going inside the dome, uh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, even though we have some... Uh, some uh, issues with uh, clarity of the video or whatever. We, we've got great audio um, and uh, the PowerPoint's coming over extremely well. So that's great. And uh, again, I want to thank both of you for doing yeah, this. The, uh, but, uh, uh, one of the things we did institute for our local astronomy club, since we have this marvelous technology, is we yeah. have gotten literally world-class speakers to give our local club lectures um, via Skype. And it's worked out marvelously. We have had people speaking from Australia, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just been great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, so Claude is... Go ahead. Uh, Claude is back. Yeah. I'll yeah. put Gavin back. Right. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Um, now, the primary mirror itself, the mirror cell, is we do not have active optics here. 
Um, we actually have a passive flotation cell. Okay. Uh, maybe, Teresa, if you could sort of give a tour of the uh, mirror cell up there. You can see in this image I took these small uh, blocks on the back of the mirror. Those are actually counterweights on a lever system where uh, oh. that uh, multiply the force of each five pound weight. Those blocks are little weights. And so each block is adjusted to supply just the right amount of force to just float the mirror. So, oh, wow. um, I guess I better not walk around. I may lose my sound again. Am I, mm -hmm. do you still hear me? Yeah, I do. Sure. Okay. I, I realize I shouldn't be walking around and stressing that USB <laughs> connection. Anyway, so all of those levers with those counterweights are adjusted to supply just enough force to properly float the mirror, just support it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's easy to do when you're pointed at the zenith, but the problem is if you um, move off the zenith, the amount of force necessary to support that mirror changes. And of course, the extreme right. case would be near the, the uh, horizon where that force goes to zero. The nice thing about this lever system, which is an old technology, it, um, from my understanding, the uh, Hooker telescope out at the 100 inch out of Mount Wilson used a system similar to this. I'm not sure about the 60 inch, but I think it, it goes all the way back to Mount Wilson. The idea is that these levers that are supporting the mirror, um, as the mirror goes, changes its angle on the sky and changes how much weight or how much force it's taking to support it, the same vector is changing on those counterweights. So it automatically changes the, um, the necessary force to support the mirror. Now, it was originally thought that that might not be enough to control our mirror. So you see all these little... Um, holes on the back of the mirror cell. Those are mounting brackets for an active mirror, active optics network of actuators that were meant to back up those levers. Well, it was found that since our mirror is only 1.6 meters across, even though it's thin, it is the active or the uh, passive mirror system was sufficient to support it. And uh, we never installed that active mirror cell system. Now, the declination system is also a bit unusual. The declination bearing, as I pointed out, is right above my head here, which is well below the main center of mass of the telescope, which is somewhere in the middle of that uh, big mirror cell. So the telescope is highly off balance. Typically, you would think you'd want to have a long tangent arm off the other side with a, a big counterweight to properly balance that. But again, due to the constraints of the building, both size and weight constraints on the pier, that was deemed not practical. So instead, what we have are these screw jacks along the side of the telescope that move in and out, compress a spring that's inside a cylinder here. It, the amount of compression is measured by a uh, linear um, encoder in here. And we know the declination, we know how much force needs to be applied, and so we measure the compression on that spring. And so we leave the telescope constantly out of balance, but support it on what I call spring suspension. Right. Now on the far side, you'll, you see there are two screws. One is, again, this force actuator for supporting the telescope. The second is our actual declination drive, just a screw jack. And that is good enough for the fact that, well, we don't have to look arbitrarily anywhere on the celestial sphere. The sun only moves plus minus 22 
23 and a half degrees across the seasons. Nice. So that is enough for us to get to those locations. And while we might, there could be some backlash in a screwjack like that, we're really not moving in declination through the day. We're looking at the sun. We also have these long tusks along the side that uh, inside here, there are on each side a 600 pound weight that is driven up and down these tubes actively. There's an encoder right here that measures where that is. So we do try to keep the telescope balanced in the lateral axis. Actually, in reality, we keep it just slightly tail heavy so that if there was an incident with uh, our friction drive, if it were ever to catastrophically break, yeah. the telescope, we hope, will slew, will skid to the meridian, not to the floor. Yes. <laughs> so uh, now the telescope. You're 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 the telescope operator, Claude. I mean, is it how how uh, you know? And I realized that this this was as big of a telescope as they could push into this dome, uh, into this observatory building. Um, uh, you know, how how on a scale of you know, one to ten. How difficult is this telescope to operate? I mean, it's it's uh, certainly a unique uh, design. I think. I, I, are there are there others like this one, or is this a very unique design? No, this is quite unique. Quite um, unique. Okay. The most most similar telescope to this will be DKIST because of okay. its design. Um, this telescope, uh, I will talk a little bit later, was built, had to be built inexpensively and quickly. This is a quick up demonstrator telescope to demonstrate the technology. So a lot of compromises were made. And due to that, well, I don't want to use the word kludge, but there are a lot of compromises. Due to that, yeah, it's, it takes... Um, it takes a delicate touch to, to drive this telescope. I see. There are only three of us that that uh, are comfortable operating this telescope. Nicholas, John, and myself. And uh, it is a unique facility. And the, the big thing is, is that primary focus with that much energy and such a confined space, if that were ever to get away from us, it would do dramatic damage to this telescope. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't want to sound egotistical about it, but it is, it is a concerning telescope. You need to keep after this telescope at all times. I see. I see. Um, Interesting. The original, that original... The original second generation telescope, that 26 inch space telescope that was meant to fly on Skylab 2, was quite a workhorse telescope here. Um, it was in operation from 72, 1972, all the way till 2007. That's wow. a 35 year record for it. So yeah. it had quite a run. Then, um, first, it was then removed. This facility, was put in, this telescope was put in remarkably quickly, just a year later, what at that time was called the new solar telescope, NST, saw first light in May 2008. Well, you can never call something new or advanced or latest, whatever, forever. We knew that uh, at some point, we would have to rename that telescope. And so um, Phil Goody retired in um, 2013 and is now astronomer emeritus. So we, Dr. Wenda Chow, had a ceremony. We had some dignitaries here. We had a dedication ceremony and uh, unveiled this new plaque, which is on the side of the pier of the telescope, that uh, renamed the telescope, the Goody Solar Telescope, in, in Phil's honor. Nice. And um, so now 
that is why that explains the name the Goody Solar Telescope. Yes. Now here, here is what I somewhat call the proof of the pudding image. This is an early image taken simultaneously with Hinode, that half meter telescope in orbit around the Earth outside okay. the atmosphere, and and here at BBSO. On the right is the BBSO. Th oh, this wow. is not a simulation. These are actual simultaneous observations. So it is clear, you can see it is the same field. You can see that, yeah, there is correlation point by point. But clearly, we were uh, able to demonstrate that the telescope, and I shouldn't even say we, I, was, I was still was uh, back in Tucson at this time, but it was clearly showing that this telescope at that time was able to outperform any other solar telescope, earthbound or spaceborne. Wow. And was able to achieve the diffraction limit. So here what you're seeing is the top of those granulation cells in the, the uh, convection cells, granulation in the solar photosphere. And what you're actually seeing is convection coming up as it uh, reaches the solar surface where the sun become suddenly transparent. Um, energy is released in the form of photons. It cools slightly, a few hundred degrees maybe, and flows to the edge of those convection cells and sinks back down. Now you see these bright points. This is some of the thing I find very interesting. Yeah. Like the sun is a plasma, it is ionized material coming to the surface of the sun. And so when that, if there is a, a non-balanced magnetic field being carried with that ionization, and that is then sweeping to those inner granular regions, what you're doing is concentrating that magnetic field in the gran inner granular region. So what you find is as you concentrate that magnetic field, it starts pushing apart those granules a little bit, allowing you to see slightly deeper down into the sun where it's a little bit brighter. Oh, wow. Now, move forward. Look at that. Move forward a decade. December 12th, the uh, Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope released its first light image. And here we have a, a comparison directly between their first light image and an early image from here. And if you look closely, yeah, I think you can see that there is some, some uh, detail in there that is beating our detail. Keep in mind this image on the right, our image is 10 years old. We have since come up with an entirely new generation adaptive optics system. There mm -hmm. are some advances in that speckle reconstruction. But, uh, so it'd be interesting to take uh, one of our latest images under good conditions and compare that but here kudos to the national yeah I, I, to be here very honest with you claude i was really resolving. i was expecting the uh the uh the, the the newer telescope to uh completely blow away uh the uh, bbso image but it's in my honest opinion it's not <laughs> it's better but but well, not by like mind. leaps and keep bounds. Not like oh my god, you know. So uh, I I would say you guys are doing keep extremely well. Yes, and that is part of the design of this telescope. Keep in mind, like I said, we know we are approaching the ultimate resolution, resolving features, the yes. uh, the finest image scale on the solar surface, and so. No matter what telescope, you're not going to be able to completely blow away our images in the visible. However, okay. if we move ahead, here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Goody Solar Telescope here, BBSO on the left, and DKIST on the right. And of course, the uh, primary differences are we're a 1.6 meter off-axis Gregorian. They're a four meter off-axis Gregorian. So two and a half times the resolving, well, two and a half times the aperture. Sure. Where we're an equatorial mount, to uh, fit that telescope into a reasonable sized dome, they went with an altazimuth design. But here, then comes the resolving power. 
we in the middle of the visible at uh, at uh, 500 nanometers have a micron we're hitting 57 kilometers on the solar surface of course we can do a little better than that if, if we push it into the blue down to around uh, uh, 400 nanometers 4,000 angstroms so yeah we can make it down to that 50 kilometer region DKIST, they're hitting 23 kilometers, which there may not really, they may be already resolve, fully resolving the sun. But the important point, in my opinion, is out at the very, the very important iron line at one and a half microns, our resolving power has dropped down to 171 kilometers on the solar surface. While they are still at 68 kilometers, they're almost able to match what we can do in the visible there in the near infrared. So that kind of, in my mind, shows the obvious collaborations for the future of this telescope. Yeah. While we can be observing in the visible, and we are several hours earlier on the sun than they can be, we can be... Uh, observing in the visible while they can be out in the infrared getting equivalent resolution uh moving on then if you go out to uh, my my area of interest out of five microns we're all the way down this telescope is down to 570 kilometers on the solar surface decus will be degraded down to 228 kilometers uh we saw first light 2008 I came in 2011, DKIST, first light 2019. I talked a lot about our, our heat stop, which uh, passes a three arc minute field and reflects away two kilowatts of power. Their heat stop will pass five arc minutes, so they'll have a larger field, and it has to absorb more than 12 kilowatts wow. of power. That has to be terrifying. Yes. That has to be absolutely terrifying. <clears throat> Our Coudet lab is uh, fixed, meaning, which means that we have a rotation in our image. Being an equatorial telescope, though, it's a fixed ray rotation of just 15 degrees per hour. And we normally just take that out in software, since our images are so short compared to the rotation. It's mm -hmm. really not normally a concern. Uh, where at DKIST, they their entire coup day lab will rotate, and it has to be a variable rotating, uh, kind of a merry-go-round type of arrangement. Um, we have a suite of visible and infrared imaging, spectral polarimetry, adaptive optics, multi-conjugate adaptive optics. Their first generation instruments are based very heavily on the instruments we've already proven out here. Then another large difference, we are at 2,000 meters elevation here at Big Bear. Yeah. 6,050-ish um, feet. That is too low for us to be a coronal site. They, we have too much moisture above us to really be able to image the very faint corona. DKIST, meanwhile, is out at Haleakala in Hawaii. I guess I hadn't mentioned that yet. They are at an altitude of 3,000 meters. So it is expected they will be high enough with, a, with a little enough moisture above them to where they should be able to directly uh, to measure and image the corona. Mm -hmm. BBSO, again, was uh, a f fairly fast up instrument, $25 million over five years. DKIS, the best official number I can find is $344 million spent over about 20 years development. Wow. Uh, our operations budget, that sounds like a lot of money, but uh, remember that old... Uh, there's an old rule of thumb that the cost of a telescope goes as the cube of the aperture difference. If you okay. take our 25 million and uh, scale that by two and a half times and cube that, that come, their, their, their cost is coming right on in. It's really surprising how well that, uh, that first order estimate works. 
our estimate, our operating budget is somewhere in the ballpark of a million per year. Theirs, I saw the number 18 million per year. So. Right. Moving on. Well, you look at the science okay. the budget of the, of the United States compared to you know, our military budget. It's actually a small fraction. So, um, you know, I think that uh, yes. the benefit that we get back is huge. And keep in mind, a third of a billion dollars, that's going to be a facility instrument for the U.S. and internationally, a general purpose solar facility for maybe the next half century. Mm -hmm. So not right. bad. Right. Um, here is another image of a panorama I took of our Coude lab. Now, most of our instruments are on this the uh, lower benches. Um, Multi-conjugate adaptive optics was a project. Um, it's a joint project between BBSO and again, the National Solar Observatory. It is uh, the first test bed was to be developed here at Big Bear. When we found out how much real estate was actually going to be taken up, we it was a bit of a problem. We didn't know where to put that. The best idea we could come up with was simply to start stacking, go vertically, start stacking our instrument benches. Mm -hmm. Everything on the top bench here, what Teresa dubbed our duck bunk bed arrangement, is <laughs> multi-conjugate adaptive optics. Wow. What is multi-conjugate adaptive optics? Well, Classic adaptive optics, as I said, works over one point on the sky and drops off in its correction very quickly, depending on scene. You go to multi-conjugate adaptive optics, that corrected wow. area you see in this video now, expands way out. It doesn't give you better correction, but that correction is applicable over a wider field. Now, what you do is why it's called multi-conjugate, that just means multiple foci. Instead of using a single deformable mirror correcting for all the atmosphere above you, what you do is you use multiple deformable mirrors that correct for different atmospheric layers independently. And uh, well, it is something that under good scene, we really don't have to have here at Big Bear for that four meter DKIS telescope out in Hawaii, it will be absolutely critical. So it's been developed here. This is the first multi-conjugate adaptive optic system uh, for solar operation. Can I make this movie go one more time? Why is it stopping? There it goes. Again, you can see that small corrected area, what we call the isoplanatic patch, in what's already then you go to multi-conjugate adaptive optics and that region spreads out. You can still see at the very edge it starts to drop off, but going from uh, maybe 10 arc seconds, you're going out to 60-ish 60 60 arc seconds correction. I see. And what uh, a single deformal mirror adaptive optics system that uh, I grew up with is already now being referred to as classic adaptive optics. <laughs> Now, uh, now Claude, here just just is, kind uh, of an amateur G whiz kind of question. These these uh, these granulation cells that we're seeing on the sun. I mean, what what are the size? What's the average size of one of these granulation cells? Um, I think uh, before I should have pointed out that I had a um, an outline of the continental U.S. as a uh, as an example. Okay. But um, basically. A granule, think of it as the size of a large state, maybe a Texas state or a California in there. Wow. So that's, it's maybe five-ish five hundred, to, uh, 500 to 1,000 kilometers, somewhere in that ballpark. Now here okay. is a movie that was made that uh, first, what I call the proof of the pudding image, was one frame out of this movie. So this is an early movie taken at this telescope, which demonstrated not only that this telescope can get diffraction limited images, but it can get that over extended periods through the observing bay. And here you can see how that plasma rising up 
the granules rising up are pushing around those magnetic bright points in the photosphere. So, beautiful movie made early on. Um, however, that's not all we do, of course. We also have that fabry pro system that looks at hydrogen alpha line up wow. in the chromosphere. Here's an image taken in the uh, H alpha center line, which nicely traces out that pla the uh, ionized hydrogen gets, um, or the hydrogen gets caught up in the magnetic field lines up in the chromosphere. So it nicely traces out the magnetic field lines up in the chromosphere. Here is an image taken in the H alpha center line over an active region. Now here is an H alpha movie, which in my opinion, I, I think this is the finest H alpha movie ever recorded. I got permission, this was taken back in 2017 and I've gotten permission to show this. You can see down in the uh, pulsations, down in the umbra, called umbral pulsations. You can see how those are propagating up along the uh, field lines up into the, chromos the chromosphere up above. You can see shock waves up in those uh, fibrils going up into the upper atmosphere. Movement everywhere. It is beautiful. I, I find this just incredible to look at. Yeah, it is. And as I said, as far as I know, I. I think this may be the finest H Alpha movie ever made. Yeah, I would. So, <laughs> I would have to leave that up to you, but I, I'm blown away. Oh. That's for sure. Hey, um, Claude, a couple of questions here. Uh, Gary Good. Palmer uh, uh, says, although you have adaptive optics to counter the atmospheric conditions, have you noticed the seeing conditions getting worse over the last five years, as it has in many parts of the northern hemisphere? No, I really haven't. I, we don't have statistics on that. and We've changed so much in our adaptive optics system. I'm not sure if I could say that. Right. Um, we are more affected by the weather patterns around here, whether the, we rely on the Pacific flow coming in off the Pacific Ocean, but yep. uh, with changing weather patterns, we often start getting those Santa Ana flows. Instead of coming off the Pacific Ocean, we get perturbed air coming off of the desert. So I don't have good statistics. I can't say one way or the other, really. And then a, another question from Paul Cotton. Yeah. He says, in comparison to the granulation, how big are Ellerman bombs? Ellerman bombs are very small. They're um, on the order of a, a below an arc second, certainly. Their region, typically in the um, penumbral uh, quiet sun boundary, where there are very small reconnections going on in the uh, lower chromosphere. So those tend to be very small. And uh, last time I dealt with element bombs, I don't think they were really resolved. So I don't think I can actually tell you the how small the scale they might be, I see. and uh, but they are well sub arc second. Okay. Now, again, dealing with that Fabry Pro, which I described earlier, not only can we observe the center line, but we can very quickly move those plates and scan through the H alpha line. Of course, in the center, that's where the the um, Hydrogen is most opaque, so you're looking high up in the chromosphere. As you go off band, you're looking through more and more of the chromosphere, so looking lower down and uh, to the point where at some point you actually are back down on the photosphere itself. You also, as you go off the center line, you see material that is Doppler shifted into mm -hmm. that band. Here in the blue, you're seeing material flowing outward. Now we're coming into the line center where it's quite opaque. Then here we're moving into the red wing where you're seeing material falling back down onto the solar surface. And when I say we can move that very quickly, I'm talking milliseconds moves between our observations. Wow. So here is a movie 
taken in the Red Wing of the H Alpha line. So here you're seeing that uh, material falling back in, red shifted away from us, so falling in towards the solar surface. And of course, you're all seeing those bright lights moving out away from the, uh, the sunspot in the photosphere below. Spectacular. With adaptive optics, <clears throat> not only can we take these different movies, but we can move through the band quickly enough to where the chromosphere doesn't have a time to change, and the adaptive optics can hold the image stably to where we can put those images together. Here's an image I'm very proud of because I, I produced this. Mm -hmm. I took three images, one from the red wing of material falling into the sun, one okay. from the blue wing showing material coming out from the sun, and the center line and combined them together and colorized it. So red is material falling away from you, Blue is material coming up at you. Yellow, green is um, is essentially stationary from your radial perspective. And uh, so this is a true Doppler gram of the solar surface. Beautiful. And I was just really blown away once yeah. I produced that. Just what a spectacular, beautiful oh, yeah. work of art that became. Yes. Um, Oh my gosh, I haven't noticed the time. So I'm not going to say a lot about this, but our infrared instrument can uh, look at specific line, a specific line at one and a half microns, an iron line that is sensitive to magnetic fields. It splits into, it's called Zeeman splitting. The line will actually uh, split and the, the amount of splitting in that spectral line is proportional to the magnetic field. Um, by measuring that and the polarization, you can produce what's called a magnetogram, showing the uh, magnetic orientation and and uh, the magnetic polarity and the uh, and the flux on the solar surface. Um, the reason for doing that is the, in the infrared is that splitting is. Uh, much greater out in the infrared. As you go to longer wavelengths, you get much, much more splitting, so you become uh, sensitive. You can resolve much finer, lower magnetic fields. So you're much sensitive to weak fields by doing these magnetograms in the infrared. We can also use the same instrument to observe a helium line just just outside the visible at uh, 10, 8, 30 angstroms. <clears throat> this is a line that's formed at the very top of the chromosphere yeah. and is uh, much less optically thick than uh, H-alpha. So you see these uh, field lines uh, much more finely resolved or oh, yeah. uh, you can see through them they are much this is a flare that was seen several years ago in the 10A30 line and using this 10A30 line you can see the magnetic field lines their orientation how they are moving around and then into the flare when there's a reconnection boom you can see how they reorient into this nice arcade after the fact it's right. a beautiful movie here. It is. So that's 10A30. That was also taken, taken with uh, the same near infrared imaging spectrometer, NIRIS. Right. Yeah. Um, um, back to the photosphere with our. Go ahead. Go ahead, Claude. Okay. Back to the back to the photosphere. Uh, just using our broadband uh, filter imager, that high speed wow. CCD. Here's a, a movie of a sunspot back when we used to have sunspots with a nicely developed uh, light bridge across there. And again, this is a modern image uh, that was reconstructed. And you can see these bright points down in the umbra, umbral bright points. And those are approaching a tenth arc second. So this is a diffraction limited image. And 
it's just a phenomenal movie showing incredible. everywhere you look, there is something incredible going on. This light bridge clearly breaking into convection from below, so somehow that convection worming its way up through the magnetic ropes making the umbra. You can see motion in the penumbra. Just You can get lost staring at this for hours, but we don't have hours, so I better move <laughs> along. Here in... Oh. Uh, November, we had that the Mercury transit. Here is Mercury. We were able to use the adaptive optics to lock onto the planet itself and then uh, track that across. It works very well, but our uh, speckle reconstruction software doesn't know how to handle the limb of the sun well at all. So this works well till we get here to the limb and then things really break down. It starts to but fall apart. That was a uh, that was fun observation. Uh, I wanted now, to here's an example point out some a paper. Claude, I just wanted to point out that you've got Marty Coons from watching from the McMath Hulbert Solar Observatory, uh, and oh. uh, uh, John McShenog uh, from Shady Acres Observatory, Shady Acre Observatory. Uh, and Shul Puri said that this stuff is like a Van Gogh work of art. You know, so it is. It is amazing. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for that. This is a uh, example of a recent paper that was published. Look, can I maybe so back with us, Claude? I, I'm not hearing well, you at this point. You're not hearing? Um, did you lose me again? <laughs> I think Claude got excited. <laughs> Am I back with you now? Do you hear me this time? Just hang in there with us, folks. Uh-oh. Do you have me back now? I don't know what's happened yeah, to my no, audio. No, uh, no voice, Claude. Hmm. Uh, Let me try. Oh. Okay. What about now? Uh, Claude, well, apparently just they can hear you, so I, I just can't hear you for some reason. Oh. Huh, we'll let you odd. talk. Okay, we'll okay, let well, you talk, and uh, we'll go from here. Okay, I'm going to move ahead. Here's an example of a recent uh, paper that was published on data. It's me. Combining okay, data from here at the uh, at Big Bear. Here is uh, the photosphere where you see those, again, those bright points, the magnetic bright points down in the photosphere. <clears throat> those were correlated with uh, off-axis, off-band H-alpha images showing these, uh, these st streamers moving up into the, into the chromosphere with the foot points from those bright points, which correlate with the uh, magnetic field down in the, from these magne magnetograms. But then they went further and uh, were able to correlate the stream from the uh, photosphere through the chromosphere into data in the corona taken from the NASA um, Solar Dynamics Observatory. So this is a nice example of tracing these coronal features from the outer atmosphere all the way down to the photos magnetic, photos magnetic elements down in the photosphere itself. And uh, we go ahead. Here's the same data revisualized, showing the uh, magnetogram, the orientation of the photosphere, the chromosphere here with material moving there on up into the corona. So this is a good example of um, how in solar solar astronomy we often collaborate with several different observatories using different instrumentation to uh, produce the science. The buzzword from this, for this I am hearing nowadays is multi-messenger astronomy. It is uh, becoming quite common on the nighttime astronomy, but uh, we've been doing this kind of thing in solar for quite some time. Now my last image is uh, just this another sunspot. Uh, Okay, Scott, now I'm getting quite an echo on myself. Um, 
here is a my last image. It's not a great image, but it's one I took quite a while ago here. And you're not getting the PowerPoint? Uh, I should be sharing. That's not on my side then. Well, um, Teresa just told me that apparently we're, you're not seeing my last image. That's not all that important. So what I'll just end on is I do want to say just a few words about uh, Big Bear Solar Observatory during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> we did shut down here for several weeks, but um, we opened, reopened after uh, coming up with protocol here that we think keep us safe here in the work environment. We um, wanted to get going back in May because we have a contract with NASA to produce support observations for the Parker Solar Probe 30 days either side of its closest approach to the sun. And that started the 8th of this month, so we're doing that for another, another month and a half. So we were very motivated to figure out a way to get back in operation, at least limited operation. The way what we decided to do for that is we only allow a single person in the uh, dome on any day. Uh, we have violated that a bit, but if we do, we have our personal protective equipment on so we do not contaminate each other. Um, so we are operating just with solo observers right now, and that is it is difficult for us to run the entire facility with a single individual as long as nothing goes wrong. This is what I'm referring to as cross your fingers mode on the telescope. Hopefully someday we will be able to return to more normal operations. And uh, when we do, I hope that uh, tours will be able to resume. And if you... Uh, you can follow us. We haven't been doing a great job of keeping our web page up to date because almost everybody is working from home at the moment. But uh, please do try to visit our web page and hopefully we'll be able to have some updates there at some point. So with that, I will say thank you very much. And uh, I can either answer a couple of questions or if we still have a few minutes, uh, maybe Teresa could say a couple of words. Okay, are you are you still with us, Scott? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm still here. Sure. Okay. Um, if we don't have any questions, maybe I'll turn the headset over to Teresa for a couple minutes, and she can say a few words about uh, how our uh, our local astronomy club and how that relates to the observatory here. Sure. Yes, I am. Well, hello again. Um, one of the things that our local club has done, which helps both BBSO and the members of our club, is we uh, work as docents for Big Bear Solar Observatory. Um, we have, oh, maybe six or seven of us that have volunteered that bring the people through. Um, when tours begin again, um, one goes to the BBSO website and signs up because there is only a very limited space in the dome. And uh, their staff is so small that they really don't have the um, ability to do tours. So we've decided, the club has decided to step in and do tours of BBSO. In the summertime, when we don't have a pandemic, we do two a month. And in the wintertime, weather permitting, we do one a month. So I think that's what Claude wanted me to talk about. <laughs> so. Okay. 
there's nothing else. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that we are um, just about finished here. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I want to thank you, Teresa and Claude, for such a great presentation. And um, uh, you know, so we have uh, we do have more programming coming up. Uh, uh, and we we have uh, made uh, the best of a of a great night and yep we're getting a little bit of an echo problem right now so we're going to say good night and we're going to thank you think say thank you very much for joining us and uh, uh, keep looking up everyone and we have more programs coming so. <laughs> Take care and uh, good night. Okay. Thank good you night. very much. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Okay.